May I welcome you to this very special class, please? And this particular series of lessons, this is our last lesson. Don't want you rejoicing too much about it. Uh, we have enjoyed these lessons very much. Uh, these lessons are very particular. There are teachings that are divine and that are inspired, uh, that, are, that are good, uh, that uh, do not tackle world situations. This, this group of lessons tackles world situations. Uh, the entire series of lessons uh, have to do with demons and deliverance, principalities and powers. And this is in a teaching syllabus here that's available to you. And this is called Volume 1 because Volume 2 deals with the cults. And this is dealing with doctrines mostly all the way through this entire teaching syllabus. Uh, we are now involved in Lesson 24. Now this will be the last of this series in this particular uh, book, and, and we would like for you to have the whole series. And you can, of course, receive the whole series in, in the audio tape. You can receive one of them, or you can receive uh, the, the master group that have been placed in this beautiful uh, container here called Demons and Deliverance, Principalities and Powers, and then it looks like this. And, and uh, then uh, you can start from lesson one and go right straight through them, and you can put it into your library and make it a part of your, uh, of, your, of your teaching area there in your home. You can have it by videotape, one half inch videotape to be played in your own home or in your own prayer meeting or your own Bible teaching. Uh, we can also give you entire uh, schooling in this and these and, and, and give you examinations and you can have these uh, uh, graded and you can receive a certificate of completion uh, for, uh, for these studies. And so they are pertinent, and they have to do with these times in which we live. Uh, the last lesson is particularly uh, joyful in that it is the finale. In the finale, who wins, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, the battle is interesting, of course, but who wins is the, is, is the, great, is the great thing. So in the, in the finale, in the end of everything, we, we see that God has won. God has triumphed. He will triumph. There is no... The devil's already defeated. Christ did that himself, so he is defeated. And then man will win. Man will reach his ultimate goals. Man will finally be what God predestined him to be so long, long ago. And, and then the devil will be where he's supposed to be. The devil will then be in the, in the lake of fire, in, in the torments, and that where, he, where he gained for himself through rebellion, through hate, and through hurting of mankind all during this, this period. Now, 6,000 years isn't very long. God is eternal, and the devil is not unleashed for any, any, any billions of years or millions of years. Uh, that is only for 6,000 years, and then he will be uh, eternally incarcerated and will not be free to torment anymore, to deceive anymore, and to hurt anymore. In our final lesson, which is our Jubilee lesson, it says that the church will replace Lucifer and his host of angels before the eternal throne of God. <laughs> now that, that'll set off the joy bells uh, ringing uh, instantly and immediately. The, eterni the, the, the eternity of God, in eternity, uh, in the far remote eternity, God created three archangels, at least. Now, there, there might be more, and, and there might be uh, many other celestial beings that we are not yet acquainted with, but we know of at least three that were very unusual and tremendous personages and, and could be classed possibly either as archangels or, or, great, or great angels. And these uh, governed and administered the will of God. Uh, they, they were placed over the other angels, other creatures, and they administered the will of God. They carried out the desires of the Most High. That was their business, to carry out the desires of the Most High. And these uh, and, and these great archangels uh, over the angelic citizens of heaven uh, uh, did their work, and they, they still do. There are in the earth today angels. Uh, we have guardian angels, and, and we haven't given enough attention to angels. I have a whole group of lessons on angels uh, that I wish you would study because it's all taken from the Bible. Uh, you know, you can become so mundane until you miss the spiritual aspects of living, and you don't understand there is a mighty God uh, that governs the heaven and the earth, and that there are angels around about, uh, about us. Our natural eyes, uh, to most of us, they have not seen them, but in our spiritual beings, we come to understand there are forces 
and strengths and powers that are available to us. Now, these three very special angels that we have just designated archangels, uh, the first one is one person called Gabriel. Now, Gabriel is, is God's messenger and minister. In, in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 21 and 22, and uh, also in, in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 16, we can see and deduce that this person leads, leads uh, the certain group of angels in heaven as, as the, the couriers, as the, uh, as the one who carries the news, as the media, heaven's mass media. Uh, and you'll notice throughout the entire Bible that when an angel came to bring a message, he usually said, I am Gabriel, and I'm sent from the throne of God to tell you this. And so the messengers of heaven are from, from, from Gabriel. And possibly all the messages to the total human race are brought by the angels underneath Gabriel because he has behind him the mighty host of angels that are communicators. And maybe all the communication on the face of the earth, that spiritual communication, is brought through this group, particular group, of the angelic host under the direction of the great prince called Gabriel, the prince, the prince of angels up there. The second one of these archangels, I uh, mentioned the word of God, is the person called Michael. Michael, the archangel. And uh, in Daniel chapter 10 and verse uh, 13, uh, you, you read there uh, of Michael. He is designator, designated, very specifically it says here, as the one who protects God's people. He was a protector of, of the people of God. So therefore, he was a warrior. It could have been that he was the very one uh, that Joshua saw when he saw this person that was winning the battle for him. He said, well, I don't know you. Who are you? Whose side you're on? <laughs> and and uh, he said very implicitly, he says, I am on the Lord's side. Uh, which meant now, uh, uh, Joshua, if you're on the Lord's side, then I'm on your side too. But I am persist persistently on the Lord's side here. And, and so, uh, anywhere uh, where there is warfare, uh, then it is, it is the archangel Michael uh, that, that is, is doing this. And in, in Jude, uh, uh, Michael contended for the body of Moses, you see. And so when there was a contention uh, that, was, that was involved, uh, he was the archangel that was involved in this. He is God's mighty leader of the armies of heaven. And so when we speak about the Lord of battles, you know, then we are speaking of, of this archangel who directs the battles of the Lord and will, I presume, throughout eternity carry on that same uh, ministry as Gabriel. The third uh, celebrated prince in heaven was the archangel uh, Lucifer. We read specifically of his uh, position before the earth was here in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 14, and in Ezekiel, chapter 28. And this, this personage I uh, call Lucifer was the, covering, was the covering angel who led the praise and the worship uh, before the throne of God. And, and he was the one that was dressed in every beautiful uh, gem. And, and the, the ecstasy of God and the Shekinah of God flowed through him. The Bible says here in Ezekiel and in Isaiah that he was perfect in beauty and, and, and that he was perfect in, in, in wisdom and that he was the covering angel who covered the throne of God and gr the greatness of the, of the mighty trinity flowed through him even to the other creatures in heaven. And then the, the Bible says that there was a great problem in heaven. Now, I, I can see you saying, now, wait a minute, how can there be a problem in heaven? It's very simple. Uh, you cannot put love under pressure or it is not love. God is love. Love has to be voluntary. And if it is not voluntary, it is not love. If you say to your wife, you've got to love me, well, you've got trouble on your hand. She does not have to love you. If, <laughs> if you say to your husband, I'm going to make you live with me. No, you cannot make anybody live with you. Now, God has the same problems, you see. God cannot say to me, you have to serve me, because then I can say, I don't have to serve you. 
I must serve God because I want to serve God. You say, why? Because that is love. If uh, God could make you into an automatum where you push a button and you do certain things, but that thing can't love you. You can buy some of these toys at Christmas time that <coughs> you can push a button and they go this way and that way, but they can't kiss you goodnight. It takes a son and the daughter to kiss you goodnight. Now, God wants goodnight kisses. God wants his people to love him. God doesn't want you to be an automatum. Now, he, he doesn't want you. He doesn't want you to be a toy. He wants you to be a person. And so, therefore, God has made you. Now, heaven is that way. Now, I don't want to hurt you too much, but uh, in eternity, you won't have to stay in heaven if you don't want to. The Bible says the gates of the city are open. At any time you feel like you want to get out of there, all you have to do is walk straight out the gate. You say, why? Because God is love. And love cannot com c compel. Because when you compel, then you don't have love. You see, love does not compel. And so God is love, and he does not compel. Everybody worships him because they want to, because they love to, and because they adore him. And that is love then. And so we find a creature in heaven named Lucifer, the greatest, the number one. It's normally the number one person that God has problems with. The one that his glory had flowed through, that all the jewels of heaven. You, you read the, the scriptures there in Isaiah and Ezekiel, and you will become really amazed at this dignitary of the excellence of this person. But he, he assumed more. He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be equal unto the Most High. <laughs> well, God was the one that made him. God only made him pretty. He didn't get that way. And, and so he lost his position in heaven. When Lucifer, because of rebellion, was removed uh, from heaven with the hosts of angels who he deceived, and, and they, they followed him and left heaven with him, there was left a vacancy in heaven. Now, listen carefully. There was left a vacancy in heaven. The emptiness was right before the throne of God. There was emptiness there before the throne of God. Now, in the council chambers of the Most High and the Divine Trinity, it was decided that Jesus Christ would come to this earth, the Savior of the world. He would purchase with his own blood a host of redeemed persons, persons, men and women, rejoicing saints, and they would come to stand before the throne of God, and they would replace the archangel, and they would replace his angels, and they and they would take their positions. I'd like for you to read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 7. We won't have time for it uh, right now. And also verses 11 and 12. And read Hebrews uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through verse 8. And you'll have a, 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 an insight into what we are talking about. Uh, now, if you want a person to hate you, just take their place. Satan hates you because you have his place. You are going to be right before the throne of God, every redeemed one. And that great corridor before the throne of God, you're going to be standing in this great place before the throne of God, praising him, exalting him, loving him, and shouting and singing unto the Lord. And that was his job. That was his place. Now you can see why he don't like you. <laughs> you take anybody's job, he's not going to like you. And so the reason the devil hates human persons is because he knew the plan of salvation. He knew what God wanted to do. And he knew that Jesus Christ had come to breed a new creation. <laughs> that Jesus came to this earth to breed a new creation. And that this new creation, called the saints of the Most High, that they will stand before the throne of God throughout eternity, praising and magnifying the Most High God, playing instruments under his name, singing and rejoicing under his name, and that's the job that he had had from eternity, and that he lost it, and we are to gain it. And there's your problem. And, and so, uh, anytime you have a confrontation with the devil, so say, you know we got your job, don't you? You know that we're going to stand right in front of the throne now and not you. And you know that we're going to be the one that exalts the Most High and not you. And, and I tell you, that'll get him all messed up simply because he has lost his position in heaven and you have gained it. Now, when you see that, you can understand all the lessons that we've taught before. You see, why you should have nothing to do with the devil, why you should not be part of his kingdom, it's a losing. Now, if you want to work with a loser, you work with the devil. 
He is a loser every time. He lost heaven. He lost in the Garden of Eden. He even lost at Calvary. He, he thought he was winning a victory when he had Jesus Christ nailed to the cross. Huh. <laughs> he didn't perceive that Christ could take that cross and make a throne out of it, and from there he would rule the hearts of mankind. Oh, no, no. That was a mistake of all mistakes. When he said, oh, drive those nails in, you Romans. Drive those nails, you Romans. Drive those nails. I I'm defeating him. He'll never take my place up there. <laughs> and that cross was turned into a throne. And from there, he rules the hearts of the whole mankind uh, and today. And so he is a loser. And he's going to be an eternal loser. He will live forever banished from the presence of God in the confines of hell. So he is a loser. Don't get attached to a loser. Jesus is a winner. He wins every time. He is not a loser. He always wins. He always will win. And so attach yourself to a winner, uh, the Lord and the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is that winner. So when the second coming of Christ and the gathering of all the redeemed of all the ages, isn't that something? The redeemed of all the ages, heaven will again be filled. Did you know there's an emptiness in heaven right now? There's an emptiness in heaven right now because the center of heaven has been evacuated. God cast out the devil and his angels. And, and, uh, and, and the center part is waiting for you to come and me to come and fill it and to sing the praises of God before the throne of God and all of heaven will ring with our praises. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that the rest of heaven can't even sing the song of the redeemed. That when we sing the song of the redeemed, that we'll sing it by ourselves, that we're the only ones that can sing it, the redeemed of the Lamb at that time. So in heaven, when we arrive there, there will be three sections. On God's right hand, there will be Gabriel, and they are his messengers. And uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 19, you see how he was bringing messages to human beings. He will be still taking messages. He'll be taking messages all over the universe. He'll be taking messages all through the angels of heaven. He gives the directives right from the throne of God. He hears, he listens, and he obeys. He starts carrying out the messages that, that, they, that the Godhead has planted upon the face of the earth. On the left hand of heaven will be Michael and his warriors. You find them talked about in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. And the warriors of heaven will stand there. You say, well, what in the world will they be doing? Well, they'll be praising God if there are no more enemies. But they'll be keeping the whole universe in line with God. That when God wants something done, they're the doers. They get out there and do it for God. Whatever that might be, we'll learn when we get there. That they, they are the doers of God, and they're out there doing the amazing things that God wants done. And, and the, so the messengers are one group, and they, the doers are Michael's group, on the other hand, in obedience to God. And then the third group... The third group, they will be identified in the front of the throne of God, and they will be the redeemed of all ages. Read about them in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, and, and say, hey, that's the group that I, that I belong to. <laughs> and, and we will be occupying the very heart, the very center of heaven as the redeemed, shouting the praises of God in a way that earth has never heard them yet. Any person that has been permitted to go to heaven uh, and has returned to this earth, they've heard the praises of the Lord singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and hallelujah unto the Lamb. And so we will be joining in those praises, but we will be the leaders in it, praising and magnifying God, filling the whole center part of heaven. Isn't that a great reason why you and I should have nothing to do with the devil whatsoever, knowing that we shall replace Lucifer himself and all of his hosts, we shall replace them right before the throne of God. We shall occupy the place that they have, that they have left vacant and that we shall praise the Lord. And so then at that point in time, in eternity, Lucifer, the revolutionary, and, and his angels or demons uh, will be forever doomed in the lake of fire. You read Revelation chapter 20 and, and, verse, and verse 10, and that will be the ultimate end of his activities. There will not be any further activities. He ha will have been judged because of his rebellion in heaven, because of his messing up this beautiful earth. God made it an Eden, and he made it a chaotic condition. And God made it a place of happiness, and he made it a place of sorrow. God made it a place of health, and he made it a place of sickness. Everything negative in this world 
the devil brought it here, and he will be judged for it. He will be eternally judged for it. And, and I, <laughs> I know you're ready for it, and, and the whole church body is ready for the judgment to come upon him. But I believe the, well, one of the greatest revelations uh, that we could have today is that the reason that Satan doesn't like you and doesn't like me and doesn't like the body of Christ and continually wants to hurt you and, and continually doesn't want people to get saved because they're actually going to occupy his job and, and they're going to occupy his position and his place in heaven and they will have and he will never see it again. He will never, he will never have any relationship to it again. And we will be in white robes, standing before the throne of God, praising and magnifying the Lord for all of his... Say, isn't it, isn't it wonderful to serve Jesus? Isn't it great to... You're on a winning team, my friend. By all means, get your whole soul and spirit and body uh, serving the Lord magnificently and, and gloriously because we are the winners and, and we have a right to praise and to magnify the Lord. And resist every evil that comes from the devil. He is a deceiver on the face of this earth today because he doesn't want you up there praising God. He, he knows he's a loser. He still don't want you there. He, he'd rather have you with him in remorse all through eternity saying, look what I've missed. Standing before the throne of God. He said, well, I missed it too. And, and I caused you to miss it. He would like for anybody, everybody to lose the place that he lost. You know, losers always love company. <laughs> yeah. Uh, losers love company. Uh, they want you to be a loser too. If I lost at the racetrack, you come on down and lose some. If I lost in Las Vegas, you come over and lose some. Losers like losers, but winners love winners, and we're winners. And that's the reason we are reaching out there to you, to see you set free from the devil's power, to see you occupied in the great truths of God and distributing the truth of God throughout your area in Jesus' name. God needs you and God wants you. In the finale, Satan has been incarcerated. He is gone forever with his revolutionary angels. They're all gone. And then the eternal ages will resume. And that's in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 3. The eternal ages will resume. There will be no more end to it. There will be no more thing that we have known on this earth before. There will be no more hurt. There will be no more briars. There will be no more thorns. Uh, there will be no more beasts that hurt. Uh, there will be no more killers. No. There, there won't be any more. Uh, all there will be is God and, and God's blessings and God's power and God's anointing and God's love. All there will be after that will just be God. And, and God is love. It's worth living for. Now, you've got to make a decision whether you want to live with God forever or the devil with ever. He welcomes you down there with him. He Misery loves company. <laughs> uh, but God wants you with him too. And so I urge you, say, say Lord, I'm going to be around the throne of God. What an honor. What a place to be redeemed of something, neighbors, more than you ever thought. Some people think getting saved just helps you down here. Oh, no. Down here it helps a little bit, but up there is where you're going to occupy the place before the throne of God. What a job. What a position. What an elevation. And may God, may God say, hey, I want you to stand right before the throne of God and sing my praises throughout all eternity. And so in the finale, uh, Lucifer and his revolutionary angels and, and the demons will be forever doomed into the lake of fire. And then the eternal ages will resume according to, the, to Revelation 21, 1 through 3. And then you and I will be in the midst of it. You ought to read that 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation 21 and 7. You and I become part of the whole scheme. We become part of the whole thing. <laughs> and at that time, you're going to say, hey, I'm sure glad Brother Sumrall taught us all about this stuff. I'm sure he, glad he taught us about how we could resist the devil and how we could win over the power of the devil and how we had a right, you know, to do these things. I'm so thankful for it. And neighbors, I would like to ask every minister of the gospel, you, you get ready to teach the truth. These are basic truths. Uh, these are vital truths. These are truths that must be taught today. And you, you that are lay people, God needs every one of us. We're living in, in the most dramatic moment of human history. As I have said again and again, God is calling for one million teachers of the Word of God. And one of the greatest themes you could teach is how you can be delivered, how our world can be delivered, how our society can be delivered from the devil's power. God is a mighty deliverer, and he wants to set you free. Please uh, receive and, and get all the material on it. Study it. 
let it become part of your total being. And remember the lesson in here where I told you that it seemed that I accidentally got involved in this. I did not know anything about it. And God brought me into it. I had to set people free in order to have good services. And so God taught me these things that I am now teaching you. And I want you to have them in Jesus' name. You can get them on audio cassettes. Uh, and we would like for you to do that. You can also get them on video, video cassettes, the half inch. And you can also get them in teaching sessions to where uh, you can receive uh, the, the lessons uh, you know, for examination. And if you pass those, you can receive a certificate.